والصلاه والسلام على رسوله وعليه الاطهار اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما هذه الحياة الدنيا الا لهو ولعب وان الدار الاخرة لهي الحيوان لو كانوا يعلمون وقال تعالى في مقام اخر لن تنالوا البر حتى تنفقوا مما تحبون وما تنفقوا من شيء فان الله به عليم صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي dear respected brothers and elders and dear mothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh It's a privilege to be among you again on this blessed day of Jumu'ah. We pray that Allah Ta'ala blesses all our dear brothers and sisters around the world, wherever they may be, with His mercy and also with forgiveness and also with His unique and divine aid in all times. Ameen. It's safe to say that at this moment in time, our Ummah is quite fragile. We are going through quite a few difficult issues and some of those issues aren't just affecting Muslims, let's be honest. They are affecting people on a worldwide scale. We aren't the only ones who are having to socially distance and, you know, uh, apply extra sanitization and wear masks. This is something that is affecting people across the world. And we continue to pray that Allah Ta'ala uplifts this difficulty and that Allah Ta'ala makes our future easy for us and that Allah Ta'ala makes us realize once again just how, much e how easy we had it and perhaps, if we have ever taken Allah's gifts for granted, may Allah give us the ability to value them truly once again. Amen. It's interesting that the point that we are coming through in the Islamic calendar now is such that we are not far off from the next Islamic advent, the next Islamic event. And that, of course, is a unique and eponymous and iconic Hajj. The pilgrimage of all pilgrimages what we would often call the journey of a lifetime. Now, it's unfortunate, may Allah Ta'ala forgive us for this, that because of the situation affecting Muslims on a worldwide scale, unfortunately, it just so happens that this year once again, just like last year, Muslims from around the world, where they usually used to be able to convene and gather in, subhanAllah, hundreds of thousands, in fact, according to the usual census and the counts and the figures of the recent Hajj, or the, before, the, before the lockdown at least, as many as two million Muslim brothers and sisters around the world gathered for the Hajj. Brothers and sisters who had saved up for many, many years. For the, many of them, it was a one and only chance they were going to get to be able to perform the Hajj. That's why when we call it a journey of a lifetime, it really is that for many, many reasons. Yet, subhanAllah, unfortunately, none of us on an official basis will be able to make that journey from outside the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That does not mean, however, that the Hajj no longer is relevant to us. If anything, the build-up and anticipation that we all feel before something happens when we feel that we are being held back for a while, the build-up only becomes stronger. The anticipation only increases. In the time of our dear Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let us remind ourselves that he saw a dream, this is documented in the Quran as well, where he saw a dream in which he was going and performing Umrah with his companions. Remember, they had not been to Mecca for a good couple of years. It was for many of them their home city where they had grown up and lived all their lives. And let's remind ourselves that despite the behavior of the kuffar, of the mushrikun, the idolaters in Mecca, Mecca itself was still very, very highly valued and had a sentimental spot in our Prophet and his companions' hearts. In fact, the night that our Prophet left the city of Mecca, performing the Hijrah, when it was quite clear that now 
the the Quraysh, there was a bounty on our dear Prophet Sallallahu life. It was quite clear that it was no longer a time for him to be staying in Mecca. He left the city of Mecca. But when he left, he didn't leave with sour grapes. He didn't leave with this negative hatred for the city of Mecca. Rather the opposite. And bear in mind, Mecca isn't, Mecca isn't um, a living creature as such. It's a city. It's a place. Our Prophet ﷺ is documented to have stated, as he left the city of Mecca, turning around to face the city, he stated that of all places in the world, of all lands, you are the most beloved to me. And if my people had not driven me out, I would never have left you. This shows us believers here in today's society as well, what it means to have sentimental value. Not just for people, of course, mashallah, we have love and affection for our dear loved ones, of course. But there is also an important element of having a sentimental value for those things which Allah Ta'ala has regarded as valuable. You know, our Qur'ans, our Masahif, our copies of the Qur'ans that we use, they are to be held in very high value. They are to be placed in a high place, kept always clean. If somebody starts going around and says it's just a bit of paper, then that's a very negative way to think of it. On that paper is printed the words of Allah Ta'ala. When Allah Ta'ala has declared those words valuable and sacred, we also hold them sacred. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states in the Quran, وَمَن يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِدَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ That the people who hold high and give honor and respect to those symbols which Allah has placed for us in this world, Allah mentions this is part of the essence of worshipping Allah in the form of your heart. In other words, sometimes some of the actions that we do, they involve our bodies like our salah, it involves our bodies moving, it involves our lips and our tongues moving, and of course it also involves a good deal of our heart, of our spirit, <laughs> going into our salah. But somebody may argue that, okay, there's an also a physical element to it as well. Allah Ta'ala mentions here that respecting those things, having honor and love for those things that Allah has declared sacred, is part of the action of our hearts that we also declare them valid. When Allah has declared them val uh, valu valuable and of high, uh, high worth, uh, worth and value, then we do as well. It's the magnetic effect. When somebody that we love is close to us, anything that reminds us of them is also valuable to us. A wonderful example of that is when our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the Battle of Badr, where the Muslims emerged victorious, Alhamdulillah, and at that time it also happened that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's eldest daughter, Zainab radiallahu anha, her husband, he was a good man. He, at that time, he had not accepted Islam, but he was a good man. Our Prophet ﷺ hadn't even asked her to separate from her husband because he knew that her husband was a nice person. He was kind and protective of her. Nevertheless, because at that time, he was still in Mecca and he had his alliances with the Quraysh, it so happened that he ended up being taken to battle and he ended up being taken as a prisoner of war. And the rule of the time was that if anybody wishes to have a family member of theirs freed, in other words, if any Muslim from the Muslim side, if they know of any of their relatives that they wish to, you know, um, sh sh show a favor towards in the hope that they might accept Islam, then it's permissible for them to give a ransom, something in turn, and as a result, they will be freed. And Zainab radiallahu anha, the rule applied to her as well. So what happened was she ended up taking a few of her possessions and then she started walking towards where the, where the wealth was supposed to be gathered and submitted in order for it to be given a ransom for her husband's freedom. And when our Prophet wasallam saw her walking, he saw what she was holding in her hand. And she was holding in her hand a necklace, some kind of necklace or bracelet. Allah knows exactly what it form was. But this necklace, our Prophet ﷺ instantly recognized. It was a necklace that belonged to none other 
Then Khadija, Sayyidatuna Khadija radiallahu anha. And I think brothers and sisters need no introduction to how strong her position was in our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's heart. So much so that even the other wives, the other Ummahat al Mu'mineen, may Allah be pleased with them, even they would comment on how much our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never forgot Khadija radiallahu anha years after he had passed, after she had passed away, and years after in which he had many other wives to show his affection towards. He still never forgot her. There was clearly a special place for her in his heart. As soon as he saw that necklace, he started becoming teary and emotional. Because that necklace, remember, it wasn't, he didn't have a picture of her. He didn't know in any way resemble her. It was just a necklace. But because it belonged to her, and she had given it to her dear eldest daughter, Zainab radiallahu anha, and now his daughter was about to hand it in for ransom, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood that the sentimental value of that item should not be overlooked. He then declared that Zainab radiallahu anha could take her husband as, as, as he was without having to give that necklace in for ransom. So that he would stay with her as an heirloom. Stay with her as a sentimental family value and uh, family article and something that would of course be considered very um, precious in the family's eyes that maybe nobody else might see it in our way. Our Prophet ﷺ showed us what it means to have sentimental value. <coughs> also part of our deen is to recognize the value of things around us. Now there is a line to be drawn. There is a line to be drawn in how much we value things. If we value the world to the point that we end up forgetting our deen, agree that is wrong. But if we value what Allah has given us and use it for what it's worth, that is not that is not dunya, that is actually part of our akhirah. I'll give an example. If somebody finds two pence or, or a one pence coin, somebody might say it's just dunya, it's just a little piece of you know coinage, what's it going to do? But several coins put together, they add a bit of value. Those many coins together they can be used in a charitable way. So even when it comes to something as simple as one or two pence that we might find stuck down the back of our sofa or here and there in our car seat somewhere, it happens to me often, I end up looking when I'm cleaning my seats in my house, I end up finding a few coins. Now those coins, we can just ignore and just assume they are just coins like other bits of metal or we can realize the value of them, put them in a place where it will actually help our akhirah and in that, we have valued that item for what it's worth. That is why in Islam, our Prophet ﷺ called wealth fitna. Now, what does the word fitna mean? Fitna doesn't mean something which is evil. Fitna means something which is a bit volatile. Something which can be used in the wrong way, but it also has a value to it as well. So long as you value it and use it carefully, it can take somebody's life. We all are aware of how many of our young generation of teenagers and young adults sadly have lost their lives to knife crime in the past couple of years. We all recognize this. But has anybody stopped using knives in their kitchen, at home, where they need it? Nobody stops using a knife. Why? Because that knife, if it's kept in that kitchen knife block at home, if it's kept in a safe drawer and taken out only when you need to use it to cut up food and prepare something, then it's of great value. Many of us wouldn't be able to enjoy our dinner if we didn't have a knife in our kitchen drawer. So the same principle applies to wealth. Use it for what it's worth. Use it for your akhirah. Now coming on to the point that I mentioned earlier regarding our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sentimental value in the world around us is also something that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam demonstrated in a way that of course was in line with Allah's deen. So when he turned and faced the city of Makkah, what was the city of Makkah? Mountains, hills, desert, sand, stones, a few shrubs here and there. Otherwise, it's a very barren, very barren land. Our Prophet ﷺ showed his sentimental side by expressing that he did not want to leave Makkah. If it was his choice, he would stay. But clearly, things had sadly gotten out of hand because of the Quraysh, and it was inevitable that at some point, he would have to leave in order to come back at a later time when things were safe. So when our Prophet then 
when he saw in that dream that he was going to perform Umrah, how must he have felt? He must have felt so uplifted. And he told his companions also of his plans. And in that way, in a large number, they gathered and they set out to perform the Umrah. And yet we also know the story of what happened when he first tried to attempt to make that Umrah. He was stopped at a place famously known as Hudaybiyah, outside the city of Makkah. The Quraysh would not let him in. He declared that he had come in peace, that they weren't going to draw any weapons. They simply wanted to come to perform the Umrah. Still, the Quraysh would sadly not budge. And what happened then? Our Prophet ﷺ, then in order to make sure that they could perform Umrah at some point, they then agreed to a peace treaty. Many of the terms in the treaty were a bit tough and harsh. They were more in favor of the Quraysh than the Muslims. Many of the Sahaba عنهم, were very, very upset. They were, they were naturally hurt. Why wouldn't they be? They had traveled over 400 kilometers in the desert. You know, when we've been for Umrah or Hajj in the past couple of years, we've managed to go maybe by a, a private hire taxi, maybe by a coach, but definitely whichever method we've chosen, it's much easier, easier than going on foot or by horse or camelback because the heat in that desert can easily kill anybody. They travel for many days simply to perform an Umrah, not for shopping, not for sightseeing, for Umrah, just to visit Allah's holy house and to express the love of Allah Ta'ala's deen, that's all they had gone to do. And still, sadly, they were not allowed to enter Makkah. They were told to return, and then they could come back the next year and perform Umrah and stay in Makkah for only three days. Can you imagine how much pain the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were going through? And yet, and yet, they persevered. As much as they were hurt, they returned to Medina, and they kept within the terms of the peace treaty. What happened? The next year, they managed to perform the Umrah. Can you imagine that one year of anticipation? How much it must have felt to them to finally to be able to perform the Umrah. And then, and then, thanks to certain alliances on the Quraysh side and the Quraysh themselves, who weren't playing by the, by the book, they violated the peace treaty themselves. And as a result, our Prophet وسلم, under full international law, even, that, even by modern day standards, he then was able to take over the whole of Makkah. And once again, Makkah was a place where Muslims were able to pray and worship Allah Ta'ala safely. I think we can all agree, just to conclude, that that must have been a huge trial indeed. Can you imagine how, how their nerves must have been made of steel? to not want to make a further confrontation, to go all the way back. And was that going all the way back, was that a failure? No, it wasn't a failure. Because Allah Ta'ala revealed the verses at that moment to tell our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Rather, this action of yours will turn into a huge victory. From then on, 14 centuries ago, 1,400 years ago, up until today, Mecca is a land, is a city where Muslims can worship Allah Ta'ala in peace. Sometimes we have to do what we need to do for the greater good. Sometimes we have to hold back. And it's a build up, a test of our Iman. But when finally things get better, they will be better in a huge, huge way. Let us take comfort from that thought. Um, what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had to experience let us take comfort for that as well, and let us take those lessons from the Hajj and the Umrah up and with us to, in this point now. The lessons of sacrifice, they are still there. The lessons of making those journeys for the sake of Allah, they are still there. If you can't make the journey all the way to Mecca, our local masjid, alhamdulillah, is waiting for us. If you're not able to go all the way out there and spend in Allah's path, then even while we are here, we can still spend in Allah's path wherever we are. Alhamdulillah. Right now, anybody sitting here, if they want to tap away at their phone, and in a few minutes, a matter of seconds, they kind of donated, donated a good amount of, of charitable donations to anybody around the world. We still are able to make those small sacrifices, which added up slowly but surely, will in, inshallah ta'ala lead to a greater sacrifice, and that greater sacrifice inshallah leads up to Allah Ta'ala becoming very, very pleased with us indeed.
as we go through these difficult moments, as we wait for things to get better, whether it be a local lockdown, national or international, let us remind ourselves, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is our role model and our guide, his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they are like shining and guiding stars for us, let us take inspiration and comfort from their sacrifices, and use that to keep us going in these difficult times too, but Allah Ta'ala grant us all the strength, resilience and positivity that we need to keep going in a way that pleases him most. Amin. Subhana Rabbi ka Rabbil Izzati yama yasifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alam. Jazakallah for the sermon of the Sheikh who has performed the Hajj by riding the bicycle from London to Saudi Arabia. As he mentioned, the Sahabas travel from Medina to Makkah. My respected brothers and elders, we all in a long journey towards the everlasting life. No one knows when our name will be called. When our name is called, there won't be, we will not be given even a second. Clever person is to collect some belongings to for his journey. Please donate generously towards our masjid and community center and our education project. Every penny and pound you will donate will give you hand in your everlasting life in the day of Akhra. There has been a great threat to our children for their Iman and Islam in this 21st century. We need to prepare them to face the challenges ahead. We need to enthrall them in the environment of the masjid to safeguard their Iman and Islam. Our Madrasa is up and running in the masjid from Monday the 14th and our weekend classes are, will be resumed tomorrow the 19th. Please enroll your children back in the Madrasa and also we are giving the new admission for new academic year. Please register your child at slmcc.razil.com or contact our mother's office. Alhamdulillah, the great mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your matchless support, we have been able to reach our 70% of our target of 100 combined project. We need another 30 adults to sign up to collect 10,000 pounds and 50 used to collect 2,500 within 60, 365 days. Our masjid management and the fundraising team will be assist you to reach your target. Remember the COVID is not gone. Indian varies are spreading in London. Many of our family members are, we miss our family members. Although some restrictions are eased, still the first covering and the social distancing are still in place. New parking restrictions are enforcement around the masjid almost whole day. Single layer line and the zigzags also not allowed from 8 a.m. to midnight. <coughs> so please take, take care of your parking. Brother Sadiqur Rahman had serious an accident and admitted in emergency. He has sent a message, his, his situation is critical condition. He received a message to make dua for him. May Allah give him Shifa and soon recovery. And also, Brother Tasneem Rahim, relative has passed in Sri Lanka. We have arrived in Janas after Jumma Shah. Allahu 
ان محمد رسول الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاه حي على الصلاه حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا الله الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي جعل لنا بنين وحفدة ورزقنا من الطيبات وسبحان الله الذي يعبده عباده المتقون في الظلال والبيات وشكرا لله الذي حرم على أمتنا حقوق الأمهات وبعد البنات والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد الذي ضمن الجنة للحافظين فروجهم والحافظات أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن تنصروا الله ينصركم ويثبت قدامكم والذين كفروا فتحسن لهم وأضل أعمالهم وقال تعالى في مقام آخر ومن يعظم حرمات الله ومن يعظم حرمات الله فهو خير له عند ربه صدق الله العظيم بارك الله بارك الله لنا في كتابه المجيد ذي سور وآيات بينات وغفر لنا ولجميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات وادخلنا برحمته جنة الفردوس أفضل الجنات أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين وأوصيكم بتقوى الله قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد هذا بلاغ للناس ولينذروا به وَلِيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا هُوَ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ وَلِيَذَّكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يده الساعة قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وصل على المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم انصر الإسلام وأنصاره وأذل الشرك وأشراره اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعا وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابا اللهم وفقنا لما تهب وترضى وجل آخرتنا خير من الأولى اللهم احفظنا وأولادنا ونساءنا من جميع الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن وأعذنا من الجنون والجذام والبرس وسيء الأسقام اللهم تقبل منا قرباتنا وصلواتنا وتلاواتنا وأذكارنا اللهم اجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين وإمائك الصالحات اللهم احفظنا بما تحفظ به عبادك الصالحين وإمائك الصالحات اللهم انصر المسلمين المظلومين في كل زمان وفي كل مكان اللهم احفظ الحرمين الشريفين والمسجد الأقصى المبارك واجعله اللهم آمنة مطمئنة وسائر بلاد المسلمين اللهم تقبل من الحجاج في سنة الآتي آتي آمين اللهم تقبل منهم اللهم تقبل منهم حجتهم اللهم تقبل منهم قرباتهم اللهم تقبل منهم وعن كلهم للعلم لعلم رسولك صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى نيابة كل من لم يستطيع أن يحج في هذا السنة آمين سمعنا وعطعنا قفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان 
وَإِيتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْضِ يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ اذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ الْجَلِيلَ الْعَظِيمَ أَيُّهَا الْإِخْوَةُ يَذْكُرْكُمْ وَادْعُوهُ يَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ وَلَذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا تَصْنَعُونَ أَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ صَوُّوا صُفُوفَكُمْ وَاعْتَدِلُوا اللهم اكبر الله اكبر اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاه حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاه قد قامت الصلاه الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا الله الله اكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين الله محفظ سمي الله لمن حميده الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل اللهم مالك الملك تؤتي الملك من تشاء وتنزع الملك ممن تشاء وتعز من تشاء وتضل من تشاء بيدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير تولج الليل في النهار وتولج النهار في الليل وتخرج الحي من الميت وتخرج الميت من الحي وترزق من تشاء بغير حساب الله أكبر
سمي الله لمن حميدا الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله 